afternoon. Hasn't this been awesome? <laughs> I think so. What? Do you have a PowerPoint, Dr. Wallach? Yes. So I'm introducing Dr. Wallach. He's on a press time schedule today, so I, um, I'd like to um, let you all know he's a professor of public health at Portland State University. It's College of Public Health and uh, College of Urban and Public Affairs. So I have to just tell you that every student that I've ever known that has had Dr. Wallach or listened to him or talked to him has nothing but good things, so I think he's going to be no pressure or anything. Um, a great bookend to today. Those of you who don't know, his full bio is in your bio packet, but also this um, article that he has written is out on the table. So if you haven't already grabbed it, you can grab it as you leave today. But I'd like to welcome Dr. Larry Wallach to the stand. Um, why don't I give you the, I brought a sun Well, thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And, you know, I feel like you must feel I've been in a marathon. I, I've never run a marathon, but I'm just exhausted. And we, we've all been sitting here exercising our brains around this stuff. And it really is quite remarkable stuff. You know, there's a, a favorite quote I have from Thomas Pynchon, the author. I don't know how many of you read anything by Pynchon. Totally impossible guy to read. But there's a book called Gravity's Rainbow. And in this 700-page book, there's a section called Parables for Paranoids. And there's a quote in that section that says, if they can get you asking the wrong questions, the answers don't matter. And you know, I think this whole day has been an exercise in trying to ask the right questions. And I think this is really an important step into making significant change. And there's almost a gra thank you. There's almost a gravitational pull toward in our society toward trying to get us to ask questions that may seem important, but they really don't resolve anything. And we just go back and back and constantly re-ask those questions, and we never get satisfactory answers. So it's a valiant thing. It's a heroic thing. It's a necessary thing. And sometimes it's a very risky thing to ask the right question. But I think we've asked some questions today, I think, that are quite compelling and that need to be developed over time. Another favorite quote of mine is Frederick Douglass, great abolitionist. And Frederick Douglass said, it's easier to build strong children than repair broken men over 100 years ago. And this is a lesson that our society has just never learned. It's so obvious. It's so common sense, but we've just never learned it. And what we continue to do is we continue to put in public health, we call it downstream resources. We continue to put resources in pulling people out of the river who are in serious trouble rather than going upstream and seeing what caused them to fall in to begin with and build supports upstream because we will never be as successful as we need to be pulling people out of the river downstream. It's too expensive, too time-consuming, and it's too little, too late, and too expensive in the long run. So go, let's go to the next slide, or can I do that? Okay, thank you. So I've been in public health for, uh, for over 40 years now. I had to count up and uh, think about that. And, there's three really important lessons I think I've learned in public health. And fortunately, I learned these lessons pretty early. The first lesson that I learned was that the major determinants of our health are external to us as individuals. They're rooted in the social structures that define our society. They are the social conditions that give rise to and shape the distribution of disease in our society. This is what's known as social determinants of health. And we know that 
historically in the United States and in virtually every other country in the world, we know that the major determinant of a society, a community's, or region's health is the level of inequality. The level of social inequality is directly related to the level of health inequality. And unless we deal with that inequality, social inequality, we'll never address these huge health disparities that we have in our society. We cannot deal with these problems through the health system, or as, as noble and as, as massive the effort might be, we can't deal with it through social services. That's obviously part of the solution, but it's not the whole solution. The reason that so many people burn out in healthcare and social services is because downstream, the stress is remarkably high. And the workload never gets less. How many of you, you've been working in this field, many of you for probably 10, 15, 20 years. Many of you probably work 40, 50, even more hours a week. How many of you have seen the workload decline over the years? Raise your hand. <laughs> you don't see it because it's not possible. Because we're not dealing as a society, we're not dealing with the root causes that give rise to and sustain the enormous burden that we're trying to deal with. Social determinants of health. The second thing I learned is that in public health, and in I think the work that many of you do, the guiding ethic is social justice. And what does social justice mean? I love some of the uh, previous presentations we had and the immediate last one started getting at this. And you mentioned John Rawls, one of my favorite social philosophers. I'm not going to go into that. But I will say that social justice is about the decisions that we make collectively, every one of us collectively, that are reflected in the public policies that we adopt in our society. Social justice is embedded in our values, individually and collectively, and those values are translated into public policies. And unfortunately, we have in our country a lot of public policies that punish people for things that are totally beyond their control. And it's embedded in all of us, by the way. We're, uh, uh, Alma talked about implicit bias. We are it. So we can't solve these problems unless we get in touch. And this is uh, something Steve said, I think, in the last presentation. Speak out loud what are the values we have that drive us. And the third thing, it's a population focus. We can't do this individual by individual. How many times I've heard, and, and I understand it, but I hear the thing, if I only helped one person, or if we spent all this money and it only helped one person. That's true, but it's wildly limited. We want to help one person, but we need to help a million people. And the way we help a million people is by designing policies rooted in the kind of social justice values that are grounded in equity. So what I want to talk, that's not really what I want to talk to you about today. <laughs> what I want to talk to you about is this issue of zip code. And this is a quote now very strongly associated with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And they, uh, uh, it's actually with a specific vice president, Jim Marks, at RWJF, that said in a blog post about a national report they had put out, he said, when it comes to your health, your zip code may be more important than your genetic code. Now think about this. I, this is something we've known for years in public health, but it depends on who says it, right? And this was associated with a big national report. Think about the power of that. Think about somebody gets sick, somebody dies of heart disease. What's the first thing you say? Oh, bad genes, right? I mean, immediately you think about the, the biological determinism of genetics. What we now know is that what surrounds you shapes you. And that your zip code, unfortunately, in this country, more and more, is seen as your destiny. You know, the American dream, this notion of upward mobility and so forth, it's now seen more as a European dream rather than an American dream. We've lost some of that. So how do we understand this? So the, the work that I've been doing over the past four or five years now with some colleagues at Oregon Health and Science University, Ken Thornburg, has to do with the, what's known as developmental origins of health and disease 
and a mechanism, a biological mechanism called epigenetics. And I'm not going to, that's like as deep as I'm going to get in the science, but I need to tell you a little bit about it because it changes everything, I think. It changes everything not because it tells us stuff we don't know intuitively, but because it provides us with the scientific mechanism for understanding that, and I think it creates a great deal more urgency and policy relevance because of that. So what is developmental origins? Developmental origins, uh, health and disease, it's a model that actually tells us how the environment, how our zip code gets under our skin and creates biological changes that affect us throughout the life course. It's just a remarkable thing. It's no longer about nature or nurture. It's about both of these things and how they come together. So we now know that the risk for chronic diseases like diabetes, stroke, heart disease, even some cancers, is programmed into our systems very early in life. From the previous generation, for today we're talking about just prior to pregnancy first through the first thousand days, so up to about age two. And by the way, the best indicator of this is low birth weight. Low birth weight is a very strong indicator of lots of unfortunate things that happen down the line. Because low birth weight is a trade-off of the, the, the fetus not having enough nutrients and energy to develop fully in all different ways. So trade-offs are made, and low birth weight is a reflection of that. Low birth weight is associated, by the way, with low test scores in schools. I mean, it's just a, a remarkable kind of thing. Low birth weight is not destiny. It's simply another risk factor. And it's an environmentally determined risk factor. And I want you to remember this as I'm talking. The mother, the woman is obviously the environment of the baby. Pregnant woman is the mother, is the environment of the baby. But the community is the environment of the mother. And we now know that these risk factors that I'm going to talk to you about today, about stress and nutrition, are mediated through that environment to the mother and then to the developing child. So what this research tells us, and by the way, using birth weight as an indicator, again, I want to stress it's just an indicator, rough indicator. But based on birth weight, at the lowest end of birth weight, the risk of heart disease is four to six times higher. The risk of diabetes is even higher. And other risks are also, uh, can, can be uh, seen just based on birth weight. So the, uh, the, the odds, in a sense, are being set fairly early. The odds, not the certainty. So what we know from this research is that people get chronic diseases not because of the genes that they inherit, even though that's the conventional wisdom, but it's because of how the genes that we have, by the way, we all have basically the same genes. You know, I mean, I have a mutation you don't have, you have a mutation I don't have, but we have the, basically the same genes. But look at us, how different we are. And part of it is that our genes act in response to the environment. Our genes change in response to the environment. I'm going to tell you how that mechanism works in a second. So it's not because of the genes we inherit, because about how these genes respond to environmental stresses. So our genes, even though people thought this and still continue to think this, are not a rigid blueprint for what our life, our, our health and social success is going to look like, but it's just a range of infinite possibilities that is adversely or positively affected by the environments we're in. So the risk for compromised cognitive function, I know tomorrow afternoon somebody is going to talk about executive function, right? And again, lower executive function is linked to lower birth weight as a, as a risk factor. Um, but this, the same things that increase the risk for heart disease, diabetes, and these other things also increases the risk for poor school performance. So the point that I want to make at this moment is many of the problems that we deal with in early childhood education and all of these wonderful programs to try and 
help those at the low end of advantage, the high end of disadvantage, these problems don't begin from birth on. These are actually wired into the systems in a developmental way. And what it means is we have to shift much further upstream. So, um, oh, you know, I skipped, I skipped a slide, but you know what? It doesn't matter. <laughs> You'll never know it. So I just want to tell you what epigenetics is. So epigenetics is not about genes. Epigenetics, epi means on top of. So it's not, it, the gene doesn't cha change, but how the gene responds in, to the environment does. So a gene is supposed to be, let's say, a tumor suppressing gene, right? But somehow, because it's in an environment with low nutrition and high stress that the mother's in and cortis mother develops cortisol and all this stuff goes on, the, the way the gene should be turned on, it's not turned on. So instead of it being a tumor suppressing gene, that switches it on and there's a higher likelihood of cancer. That's just one example. But epi refers to, uh, so epigenetics is this mechanism by which these insults to the developing baby are translated into biological impact. It's above or on the gene. The genetic code does not change, but again, it's these biological switches on your genes to tell them how to act that are turned on or turned off appropriately or inappropriately based on the interaction with the environment. And the main interactions are three. First one is nutritional deficiency, which creates stress. The second one is stress, stress from, say, domestic violence, racism, poverty. This is what is sometimes referred to as toxic stress. This is the ordinary stress that people have and rise above and makes us a little bit stronger. This is the kind of debilitating stress. And then the third thing is toxics. Toxics, not toxic stress, but uh, exposure to toxics and drugs. So those are the three things that are most influential. So these altered regulatory commands that get into the genes can be passed from parent to child and actually across generations. So in a sense, you inherit, you can inherit the epigenetic adjustment that was uh, programmed into your genes. And again, we could talk all day about this like all the other topics you've talked about because uh, it's really fascinating. It gets technical very fast. But all you need to remember is that we now understand how the environment literally gets under your skin, creates biological changes, that affect the life course for health and social success over your entire life. And the period of most intense change is the first thousand days, because that's when all of the organs and systems are being formed. By the time you're born, except for your brain and uh, I think your heart, your systems are pretty much developed. You've got all the system capacity you're going to have at that time. It's pretty much developed. So um, one way we think about this is the double hit. So the first hit is the vulnerability that you're born with on that day. So on that day, I have a theory myself that one of my problems, I came from a family where there was, I believe, around when I was born, there was a lot of stress, right? So when I think about my own reaction to stress, I think back that it was conditioned during that time because my mother probably was under a lot of stress, generated a lot of cortisol, which was passed from the, through the placenta to me. And then when my stress response system was being wired, it was being wired in response to that, that cortisol. Now, I've grown up in very favorable environments, right? So that initial risk I might have for maybe a very quick trigger on different issues has been modified because I have been, had favorable, very supportive environments, right? But that's just a personal example of, of how I think that, that happened. So the first hit is the vulnerability that you have that is from previous generations. And there's been studies that show that these epigenetic effects will last, will, will go through three generations. The second hit comes from the hostile environments 
marked by systems of repression, racial and other discrimination, and social disadvantage, that will increase the likelihood that the original vulnerability, the original risk, ends up becoming manifest in disease because of continuing insults from the environment. Because some of these changes, as I said, are transmitted across generations, if we have programs and policies to address the second hit of one generation, it can influence the first hit of the next generation. The reason I believe that this is the greatest equity challenge facing public health, and I think our system, our society, is because what this tells me, what this tells us all, is that people are being born into this world at a systematic disadvantage that is beyond their responsibility, and then we have created environments which magnify rather than reduce this disadvantage over time. And by the way, many of you who continue to work long hours and don't see your workload decline, you know that it's in part because over the past generation, we have reduced the amount of money that goes into social support and education by just remarkable levels. It's the new normal, right? We don't think about it. I mean, at the university, we know we're trying to get to a level of funding that's the same level of funding that we had in like 1995, and we're going to applaud and jump up and down. But we don't realize how our own social system now is wired politically, in a sense, for very depleted levels of resources with exceedingly high demands without the realization that it wasn't always that way. I love the lunchtime presentation. I've heard him before. And the most striking thing is that first slide where he shows poverty being cut in half and saying, we can cut it in half again. And people don't think that first slide, it had to be a surprise to most of you, right, to see that we had gone from 25% down to about 12%. Because if somebody had told you that, you wouldn't have believed them. Because that's been programmed out of our minds somehow, that we've been successful with social programs in government. Why? Because the past two generations of politicians have done what? They've basically focused on the incompetency of government. The government can't do anything right. Yet here, we were able to cut. And if you look at, uh, you know, let me just tell you this one, one thing uh, on this, because from World War II up until the 70s, and you'll, you'll note that he mentioned the 70s, we saw what economists call the Great Compression. It was the greatest reduction of income economic inequality that we had seen since we started keeping numbers in the early 1900s. Now, not every group benefited from this equally, obviously, and we have a lot of work to do there. But from the, from we, and we saw it because there was, and he talked about this, the huge investment into infrastructure by the government and educational opportunity, GI Bill and housing and highways, transportation systems, apprenticeship programs, labor unions, all of these things were going on. And all of a sudden, of course, what begins to happen in the late 60s and 70s, and it doesn't just begin with Ronald Reagan, although he said what? Government is not the answer. Government is the problem. But it began, began before then. And then we've gone from 73, of course, into 2010, 2008, when we were back up to the highest level of inequality. And this is why what you're doing downstream has increased so much. Anyway, um, so we need to think about the first hit, double hit kind of uh, idea. So these are my upstream questions. And, and I think you guys are all getting right to these upstream questions because I've heard variations of these today. But we ask people to stop and to think, what would Oregon or whatever community you want to mention look like if it were the best place in the world to be pregnant and have a baby, from, from the point of view I'm talking about, this developmental origins. What would it look like? Because often we start from a very constricted way. You know, we have these silos. Some people call them cylinders of excellence, but they're really silos. 
But if we step back from that and we really take the big view, and I heard so many good examples, by the way, to, to, to today of people asking different questions. I'm trying to remember that one now when it, it was not what happened to you, but what matters to you. Was that you that said? There were so many good things there today that change everything, right? You change the question, you change everything. Let's take a step back and think, what would need to change? You know, what would it actually look like? If we walked the streets of East Portland today, what would we see? And then if we said what would need to be different, what, what is it that we'd want to see? What would be the physical visual manifestations of change? What would need to change? What kind of policy change is needed to make this happen? Right, shifting from the program delivery thing up onto this larger thing. How can we mobilize the necessary political will to make this happen? And how can that change be initiated, supported, and accelerated? How can we build on the good work that's already been done? I wondered, and I wanted to ask, Janet Bird encouraged me to ask, but I didn't ask any questions, but wanted to ask him after his presentation, you have such a clear policy agenda. You have an idea of what it would cost. You have an idea of the benefits. We could figure out, because we're the smartest nation in the world, right? Probably. The Canadians don't think so, but anyway. Uh, we could figure out how to get it done. Where is the social movement around that? Why aren't we all dropping what we're doing? And I'm not, I don't mean this, but why aren't we saying, let's get together with this guy because if we do this, we can go on vacation, <laughs> right? But of course, we're all programmed. We can't because everything is essential. Everybody's operating at this level. And you can't just stop what you're doing, even though this guy may have the greatest analysis since sliced bread. You didn't need an analysis for sliced bread, but you get the idea. So these are some of the things that I like to think about is how do we create a social movement? Because when you think about the changes we've seen in our country, the great changes we've seen, they've been the product of social movement, social movements, the labor movement, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the child welfare movement, the peace movement, the freedom to marry who you want movement. I mean, we have seen massive changes. And by the way, all of those movements are not rooted in data. Data are necessary but not sufficient. They're rooted in a sense of moral urgency and what's right and what's wrong. And the fact is a crisis is created and we are forced to pay attention. And somehow we've lost that. We've lost the ability to do that. So anyway, it basically, we, you know, this is, you know, I did some work on social movements and the evaluation studies and so forth. This is sort of what you need to happen. You know, you have to set the agenda. You have to create a sense of urgency. Somehow we don't have that. Maybe there's too many urgent things. Maybe because the media has us always asking the wrong questions, so the answers don't really matter. We need to develop policy goals. We need to know what needs to be done. When a legislator says, yeah, that's a serious problem, but what can we do about it? And what do we often say? Well, it's really complicated. You know? <laughs> or, gee, it depends. Or my favorite one is, well, we all need to work together, right? And do so, <laughs> which is all true. But you know, was it Mark, the lunchtime speaker? Well, yeah. Well, Mark, he's got it, man. He's got our policy goals. And also, we have within the poverty reduction area, we have a set of policy goals too. Then we have to frame the issue. We have to link the issue to deeply held values. You know, it's really interesting just watching the political stuff now. How much, who uses data and who doesn't and what kind of data are used and so forth and so on. But really what's driving people is not reality, it's about values, about what the reality is. How do you get people to vote in ways that seem opposed to their own economic self-interest? You do it by focusing on values that, that are a higher level thing. Um, creating political opportunity and then mobilizing the resources to take advantage of that opportunity when it exists. That would be something to think about. But obviously there are obstacles. And with the developmental origins of epigenetics, there's you know, enormous complexity. 
Everything is connected to everything, as we heard today. Where do you start? And if you start here, does that mean the other end of, or other number of places you might start aren't as important? How does all this thing connect it? Because you can't do everything at once. How do you balance the notion of getting something done right now because people are hurting, but not sacrificing the opportunity to create really long-term change so not as many people need the services? This is, this is tough. Funder, uh, oh, I talked about the silo or cylinders of excellence. Funders often don't want to focus on the glue, and we heard this notion of glue, I think, a little bit today, the glue that holds these things together. They want to focus on the individual pieces. But the glue, you know, I often tell people I'm working with, we need a grant from the Elmer's Foundation. And they say, what? I say, you know, Elmer's the glue company. Because we need, because everybody is coming to all these coalition meetings and everybody's meeting that and so forth, and then we come back and meet next month and I forgot to do what I was supposed to do and so forth, because we don't have the glue to put these good intentions together and translate them into real impact. Um, you know, the intergenerational stuff, uh, these last two are very important, I think. We have a tendency in our society to assign personal responsibility on the person with the problem, no matter what the circumstances are, and then really serve as cheerleaders to try and help that person overcome the problem. I love the Jeff, Jeffrey Canada, uh, I think it was Holloway who had the Jeffrey Canada quote, because I didn't know he had that quote. But what I used to tell people is, you know, Lisbeth Shore, how many of you have heard of Lisbeth Shore? She wrote a book 30 years ago called Within Our Reach. And that book, would be, if you read that book today in this group, you would say, this has all the answers for us. And it was about dignity, wraparound programs, treating people as families in the context of the community. But what she said is, we're a society that loves it when people beat the odds. And we are cheerleaders for people beating the odds. But what we forget is, for everybody who beats the odds, there's thousands that fall victim to the odds. And just like Jeffrey Canada said, what we need to be is we need to be odds changers. We need to change the odds so more people can succeed, not primarily be the cheerleaders for people who are beating the odds and holding them up as examples. So it's not about personal, individual, and behavioral factors. It's about these broader social economic factors. And you guys uh, all know this. So I just want to wrap up with this uh, final thing. Because when I, I spent a lot of time at, in uh, Berkeley, California, I was a professor at UC Berkeley. And uh, when I left Berkeley, a, a guy I had enormous uh, admiration for named Herb Chow Gunther. Herb was the director of something called the Public Media Center in San Francisco. And it was the first social advertising agency. They had a couple of corporate accounts, but basically they just had those accounts so they could work with farm workers and ban the bomb. I mean, that's how old it was, ban the bomb and stuff like that. And they did, worked for years and years. So Herb's, Herb's father was German. His mother was Chinese. And when I left Berkeley, Herb gave me this beautiful calligraphy that his mother had done. And it, it sat on the, my office wall when I was a dean at PSU for many years. And then a couple years ago, uh, when I was still dean, I started looking at it. And I remembered what Herb had told me about the story of it. Because I said, Herb, what is it? You know? He said, it's the Chinese symbol for the carp dragon. I said, well, what, what's that? He said, well, the, the, it's, it's a symbol that represents a story where a carp swims upstream and it gets to the waterfall and it does everything it can to try and get over this waterfall. It just at the point of maximum exertion in almost fatal fatigue, it transforms into a dragon and it flies over the waterfall. And you know, I didn't think much about it after Herb told me the story, but I, I stared at this on my wall for many years, and then finally I realized at the age of about 62 years old that this is what I've been looking for my whole career, is what is that point of transformation? And we're all looking for that. And I also realized that I somehow had some delusion when I was younger that I could be the transformation. But of course, none of us can be the transformation. But it's realizing this sort of interconnectedness, we're all in this together kind of idea, the shared fate idea, 
that our well-being is connected to everybody. That's what the transformation is. But we have to embed that in our social policies in order to create the change so we can all benefit. So I wanted to leave you with that, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today, and I, I hope I didn't take... No, um, you're right, good. Okay, perfect. So Great. thank you. Yes. So if there was ever an appropriate time for a mic drop, that would be it. Um, so we're going to take time at tables, correct? Or what do you think? I th it, it, what do folks think? So let's just have some questions and some reflections back. I think we're in a point where we can be with each other for the last 10 minutes. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Like Good. questions yeah. now. Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that. So I'll just, one, one thing. Um, this, I, I, you do have a paper on this epigenetics, which is a, a academic version of a talk I gave at City Club in Portland, so it was intended to be a translational thing. I, w I was so brief on this epigenetics, I don't want to oversimplify it. You know, there's a quote from Einstein saying, our challenge is to make things as simple as possible, but not one bit simpler. And if, if you make it too simple, you trivialize it, and I worry I trivial trivialize this really important concept, but mm -hmm. take a look at the paper, because it's, yeah. it's really important, and it just builds everything that we believe, I think. Mm -hmm. Comments, reflections from